Let's talk a little bit about uh, realism. Okay, so you know, um, you know what realism is. We've talked largely about uh, two views um, of universals, right? So uh, universals being uh, general nouns that you apply to multiple particulars. So human would be universal because it's general noun, uh, and we apply it to me, and we apply it to the stage, and we apply it to you, right? Um, but we're all distinct particulars. Okay, so part of the question that realism raises is whether or not there is anything in reality to which general nouns refer. So when I say I'm human and Ani's human and you're human, uh, am I saying something about reality, right? There's a nature or there's an essence that's either in the thing or external to the thing or something, but there's something to which I'm actually referring to. Or, or are we just saying, well, that's just some type of heading that my mind catalogs us all in because it sees certain similarities, but those similarities are not substantial. There's actually nothing in reality uh, to which they refer. And we talked already about um, extreme realism, extreme realism in the context of Plato. And you'll remember that extreme realism is the view that, yes, there is something in reality to which uh, general nouns like human refer. And that something is an actual ideal substance outside of particulars in the world of the forms. Um, the modified version of this, which isn't really extreme realism proper, is that the, uh, the referent is the archetypal idea in the mind of God. Um, not quite as extreme as Plato's own version, uh, but that's sort of the Neoplatonist revised version of it. Uh, but that would be extreme realism. Um, and then there's modern realism. Okay, and moderate realism is the view that the general noun refers to a nature or essence that's actually in the particular. And in this view, this was the view advocated by Aristotle, where there's no such thing as a universal that exists external to the particular. Why? Well, because if we went to a different world, the world of forms, and we had ideal substances, those um, universals would actually have situation, location, which are accidents. Um, and therefore they would be particulars. In other words, Aristotle presumes that whenever you encounter some type of substance, the substance is always particular, uh, and therefore you can't have a universal substance. You can only have particular substances that have in them universals, right? But you can't have just pure universal substances. Okay. So that's moderate realism. The third uh, view that enters into the picture in the medieval period, or at least in the late scholastics, is nominalism. So nominalism is the view that uh, general nouns are just that. They are names. So the claim is that general nouns are just names that we apply to multiple particulars, but there is nothing outside of the name and the mental concept that actually is universal. There is no eminent nature or essence in the thing that we're identifying, nor is there something, some ideal substance external to the thing. Okay? So let's talk about these three views and how they continue on or don't continue on in medieval Christian philosophy. Okay? Extreme realism has always been the minority report in Christian philosophy. Okay? Um, there's perhaps one exception here. If we talk about archetypal ideas, okay, if by ideas we mean ideas in the mind of God, the Neoplatonist concept rather than Plato's concept, then this is actually a majority report. The church fathers advocated that. They presumed that God had some concept of what he's making. Um, and the medievals continue to advocate that. Thomas Aquinas advocates it. Bonaventure advocates it. This tends to be just relatively standard across um, Christian orthodoxy. Uh, interesting again, medieval, high medieval, I should say. So that's actually quite common, um, but it's questionable whether that's actually extreme realism because the ideas are not necessarily substances, right? And so this is where the correction to Plato sort of moves this version more into the modern realist camp. So it's sort of a judgment call. I'm inclined to say that's not extreme realism, okay? Now, the one person who perhaps could be called an extreme realist is John Scotus Irigina. Not to be confused with John Duns Scotus, who we talked about. John Scotus Irigina. Um, so John Scotus Irigina. Um, there are some indications that perhaps uh, this Scotus, not to be confused with the Duns, uh, actually held to a form of extreme realism, because this Scotus tends to talk 
as if um, Adam's sin brought about some type of corruption in humanity proper, meaning the archetypal form of humanity, and then it's our participation in that archetypal corrupted form and so on that uh, is what brings about, uh, what brings about corruption uh, in us, original sin. There is one other place where I think um, Thomas Aquinas slips into a bit of extreme realism, but I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, moderate realism tends to be the more dominant uh, view. Okay. So moderate realism, the idea that you have imminent form, uh, that is um, form that is within particular, tends to be quite uh, dominant in the time. Okay. So you see this in people like uh, Thomas Aquinas. You see it in folks like Bonaventure. We see it in folks like John Dunn's SCOTUS. Uh, so this tends to be quite common. I mentioned that hylomorphic metaphysics continue to be dominant in the period, and this seems to be one such example of it. Um, now, there is a question here. Whether or not when everyone talks about eminent form in the period, everyone means the same thing. But some seem to mean something like shape, that form does equal shape. And you can find this as early as somebody like Boethius, immediately writing immediately after Augustine here, uh, that Boethius wants to say, well, we talk about the form of the thing, and he's using all of Aristotle's categories. And he's, but what's interesting is, like in his treatise on the Trinity, he distinguishes the form itself, which is in the mind of God, from form in the thing. And he seems to speak as if the form in the thing is something more like the shape of the thing that either conforms or diverges from the archetypal idea. Um, for the folks who hold this sort of view, which um, there are some, they get a little closer to extreme realism uh, because there's a sense in which even they, though they've run with the Neoplatonic view of archetypal ideas, uh, they still seem to think that nature or essence form has to do with whether I'm conformed to that idea or divergent from it. There's not an eminently present universal. So that's one thing that's happening there. Um, another view is uh, a variation on this. Um, the other view is that there's some sort of individuated uh, universal in the particular. So remember we talked about this, the idea that, um, yeah, we can talk about humanity and there's the nature of human that Anya has and I have and you have, but once that uh, nature essence is put in matter and it's made particular, it becomes individuated so that my humanity, the humanity in me is now my humanity and not your humanity. Um, that's the notion of individuation. You also remember that in the patristic period, at least in the Eastern writers, that view was rejected because that was the view proposed by John Philoponus and it was the view uh, of the Trithetes and the pro-Nicenes arguing against the Trithetes said that's crazy, no. Um, you've basically conflated universals and particulars. The universal can't be particular by definition. That's what makes it a universal. So uh, you don't have three humans, uh, which is what you would have if my nature was not your nature. Uh, instead, what you have is three human singular persons. Uh, the persons are plural. The particulars are plural. Uh, the nature is not. Okay? Uh, but you do have some folks advocating this. And uh, one of the folks who's most known for advocating this is uh, Thomas Aquinas, so that's another view. And then the third view, of course, is that you just have the straight imminent form view that I describe as held by the Eastern writers. Uh, and this is where you seem to have some folks like, it seems like Bonaventure or Scotus seem to be more sympathetic toward uh, this view. Uh, that's my assessment of them at least. Okay. Uh, and so could we say that uh, basically everyone in the medieval period is a moderate realist, or at least folks who are on this side of the realism line? Yes and no. It depends on really two things. Uh, the first one is it depends on whether or not uh, folks who advocate form as shape like Boethius uh, and then identify the, that form as not truly form in comparison with the form that's in God's mind, whether that would be a form of extreme realism. Perhaps it is. If you'd say that, then they wouldn't be moderate realists, they'd be extreme realists. The other thing where I would mentioned in passing already that I think there are certain aspects of Aquinas where he seems to slip into a type of extreme realism. Aquinas wants to advocate uh, that 
you have, let's say you have a particular here, Bob, right? So you have Bob, and Bob is form, and Bob is matter, right? Okay. Well, you remember that I talked about the body-soul dualism of the uh, Greek patristic writers, who thought your body has one type of nature, it has its own animal nature, and then the soul, or the rational spirit, has its own type of uh, spiritual nature. So you have two natures, but they're combined in one person. Uh, and this was over against Aristotle's view, where the eminent form, human, actually is the nature, or is the, uh, is the soul of the, uh, the being. Right? Well, Aquinas actually ends up going back to that monist view of Aristotle and arguing that the eminent form is the soul and that the material that it forms is the body. Well, one of the implications that comes out of this in Aquinas, and we'll come back to this when we start talking about particularity in the medieval period, but one of the implications that comes out of this is the claim that, well, what about immaterial creatures like angels? Are they pure form? Aquinas' answer is yeah, you bet. Right, so according to Aquinas, what you have is you have angels. Uh, let's, we've got our angel up here. Mm -hmm. So this is Gabriel, let's say. This is Gabriel, not Bob. So this is Gabriel. Um, Gabriel is form only, no matter. There's no matter that uh, Gabriel has. Um, now, that might raise a question, because you might say to yourself, well, wait a second, if form is the species, the nature, or the essence, um, and particulars are what you get when you stick the form in matter, then is Gabriel not a particular? And Aquinas, again, says, yes, that's correct. So according to Aquinas, angels, uh, angel, or the word angel is a genus, and every particular angel that we name, it, like Gabriel, Michael, none of these are particular angels, as in particulars within a species. Every one of them is a species unto itself. So Aquinas will say things like, Gabriel is the nature or essence of Gabriel, because Gabriel is his own species. And this is actually how Aquinas tries to explain why angels don't repro reproduce. Why not? Because there are no particulars within the species that can breed. Well, the reason I bring this up in this context is because if the defining trait of extreme realism is that you believe that form can exist independent of particulars, Aquinas has just argued that in reference to angels. Every angel is a form existing independent of matter and thus is independent of particulars. And this is the point where I think Aquinas does come quite close to falling back into extreme realism. So again, there's some judgment calls as far as where you would dump you know, everybody. Is, are they all moderate realists? Are they extreme realists? Or is there some kind of mix? I would say there's some kind of mix. Let's talk about uh, nominalism, since that's the one that's newest. Nominalism is the newest one on the market. This one emerges in the uh, late scholastic period, largely attributable to um, William of Ockham, although there are scholars now uh, who are arguing that nominalism, as we know it, is not what we think it is. Um, nominalism comes from the Latin nomen, uh, which equals name, right? Uh, so the claim here is that um, when we talk about universals, we talk about human, we talk about redness, we talk about whatever, uh, these are just nomen. They're just names that we apply to various particulars. But in terms of the particulars themselves, there's actually nothing in them to which we're referring. We're referring to a sort of mental catalog where we've lumped a bunch of things together that are in fact all disjointed in particular. Uh, so another way of thinking about this in terms of nominalism, uh, all is particular. Okay? Uh, so you are your own special little snowflake. Uh, Anya is her own special little snowflake. There is nothing actually connecting us. There is nothing real, ontologically speaking, that connects Anastasia and myself and you, um, other than the name that we apply to all of us human, but that's nothing more than a name. Um, this was considered suspect for a number of reasons. Some of the reasons were theological, some of the reasons were philosophical. Um, we're interested in both because there's actually an overlap in terms of philosophy. Let's talk about uh, the, just the pure philosophical reasons. 
it was considered suspect that you can actually advocate nominalism and have uh, certain things such as mathematics. Let's think about it this way, you know, okay, if we say, uh, well, I have a pie here and I cut it, you know, into four pieces and I say, okay, so how much does that represent? We'd say one-fourth, right? But the problem is, uh, do we think that one-fourth actually refers to something meaningful in reality? Is there such a thing as a quarter of a slice of pie? And on the nominalist view, it seems like the answer has to actually be no. Why? Well, because in reality, the four pieces that are now separated are only conjoined in the mind, right? So it's in the mind that I recognize that there was this once this whole pie, and I've now broken that whole into four. Uh, and it's for that reason, the reason that my mind is still mentally associating these four pieces together, that I then call one of them one-fourth of a whole. But in reality, all I have is uh, I had one before, and now I have four, right? But now, there's also a question there, right? This is not a fourth, it's, it's just one. I said in there that I had one, and now, when I cut it into four, I have four. But that's part of the question. Do I actually have four? Again, if we separate these out, you know, one, two, three, four, without advocating realism, do I still actually have four? Again, four seems to be that uh, the mind is associating these isolated atomistic pieces together, uh, but in reality they are, they're, they're not together. There's nothing that binds them together if you're anomalous. Um, so certain basic mathematical truths even, addition, subtraction, all that seem to start being, they seem to be mental conventions that help us just like the other names that help us, like human, 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 but they don't actually have any sort of secure, stable reference in Reality, math and reality do not correspond. Math refers to a certain mental world, not to the real world. Another major problem that we can point out here is an epistemological problem. Uh, let's think about it this way. Let's pretend that my mind tells me that in this room right now, uh, there is Anastasia, myself, a computer, and a unicorn right there. Or let's, let's put it right here, like right here, like right here. There's a unicorn, okay. Would you presume that my mental faculties are functioning correctly? No, you would call that a malfunction, right? You're insane. Uh, there's something seriously wrong with you. Why? Well, because your mental faculties are telling you that there's a unicorn right here, and there's not a unicorn right here, okay. Granted, I agree. But here's one of the problems. If you're a nominalist, you believe that people's faculties are doing that all the time. You know, from the moment you can talk, you start to say, look, mommy, a dog, and look, mommy, another dog, and look, mommy, another dog, look, a human, another person, a person, a person, a person, right? You start to speak in general nouns immediately, which means the default setting for your mental faculties is realist. But if realism is, is false, then what that tells us is that from the moment of birth onward, your mind is telling you that things exist that don't exist. Human, dog, cat, circle, one-fourth, two, four, right? And if you're anomalous, those things don't actually exist. They exist in the mental realm, but not in the real world. Well, what's the difference between that and if I say, well, this unicorn exists in my mental realm, but not in the real world? It seems that the end result of nominalism is that our mental faculties are malfunctioning. They're telling us all sorts of things are real, that aren't real. Uh, and then that just raises the question, if my mental faculties are malfunctioning, why do I trust anything they tell me? Right? Why do I trust my eyes, my ears, my nose, my mind at all? Okay. So those are a couple of rather serious philosophical problems. There are also some theological problems with it as well. The theological problems include things like this. Okay, I'll just give you four areas uh, of theology that seem to be uh, face serious problems in nominalism. It's true. One of them is the Trinity. Why? Well, we've already talked about this when we were going through ancient Christian thought, that uh, the doctrine of the Trinity presumes realism, right? When you're talking about three particulars that have a common nature, and there's something real that joins them, that they are really one in a certain realist sense, uh, you're talking modern realism, right? You're talking about a nature that is in three particulars. 
if you get rid of the notion of common natures, then you have no way of talking meaningfully about the Trinity other than just saying, well, it's a big mystery, we don't know how, but you just can't speak in Nicene terms, right? So that was part of the problem. Uh, think about Christology. The entire notion of Christology is that Christ has one nature and then takes on a second nature, uh, but there's only one person in whom these natures are united. Well, all of that talk becomes totally meaningless uh, under anomalous framework. It becomes a mere so word game that we put together, but in terms of reality, there actually is nothing. You know, there's nothing there in terms of one nature, two nature, one person, right? Something like that. So Christology starts to fall apart as well. Think of soteriology, whatever your soteriology is, whether you're talking about the sort of notion of participation in divine operations that we talked about, reference to the Eastern Fathers, or you're talking some sort of theory of atonement, which becomes the dominant theme in the West. Uh, either way, you're talking about some sort of need for Christ to become one of us. Uh, but one of us has to be substantial, ontological, not mere words. Right? But under nominalism, it becomes mere words. So all the views of salvation, soteriology, become problematic. Last thing is the existence of God. Um, for the nominalists, not only does math become suspect and start to fall apart, but so do the proofs for God's existence. Why? Well, think about um, the ontological argument. All of these arguments about uh, modal necessity, contingency, and possibility are realist concepts. And if you get rid of realism, you get rid of the entire framework for those arguments. Uh, and so this is one of the reasons why nominalism couldn't actually sustain those arguments, much like other things that it couldn't possibly s sustain. Um, and for this reason, nominalism was considered theologically suspect uh, and was never really embraced as sort of the mainstream uh, philosophical position in Christianity, although it did end up having uh, a very you know, illustrious heritage in modern philosophy that we'll get to down the line. But in terms of medieval Christian philosophy, it was always considered suspect.